Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. And of course, you know who this guy is. Um, in this video, I'm going to talk about how the Earth stopped getting greener 20 years ago. So, if you measure the global primary productivity or the amount of plant basically growth in petagrams per year for forest, we're just talking about land-based vegetation in this case, then it basically looks like the earth stopped getting greener 20 years ago. Now, there's a lot of factors that are involved in this. You know, of course, people destroying forests, you know, massive amounts of fires in um, the Amazon, for example, and uh, desertification, you know, more and more deserts, less and less grasslands and uh, forested areas. But there's another factor which seems to be a, quite large. Now, a lot of climate deniers will tell you that, you know, with higher CO2, there's the CO2 fertilization effect, so there'll be more plant growth sucking up more of the CO2. But the, and, and this has contributed to greening, but that greening um, was reversed about 1998. And one of the things, a very recent paper, which I'll show you and talk about, talks about how this vapor pressure deficit effect, as well as other factors, has overtaken the fertilization effect and thus you know, stopping the earth getting greener. It's becoming less green over the last uh, few decades. So let's look right at the data. Okay, so this is my Twitter. Feed. <clears throat> okay, uh, you can see me here at, uh, okay, go home, or, or sorry, there I am right here. So at Paul H. Beckwith, and, uh, you know, basically, um, this is an article I'll talk about, and then I'll talk about the peer reviewed paper that's behind this article. I just wanted to mention a couple other significant things. Um, Bernie Sanders has unveiled a $16 trillion Green New Deal plan. Okay, so this is, um, this plan, you know, if he was to be elected, um, you know, would go a long way towards, uh, you know, taking some action on, on climate change. Okay, and as Bill McGivern says, it would save a fortune by helping to keep heating under some kind of control. Okay, I've um, been talking about the sea ice a lot lately, and Zach Labe um, created this diagram here. So a lot of people have been talking all summer about a record low sea ice extent this year, even perhaps a, a blue ocean event. But recently, this curve is really starting to flatten out for 2019. What you can see here is you can see the sea ice annual minimum extents okay uh, for previous years and uh, so last year for example is over here this was September this is the date this was September 21st when we reached the minimum of course we had the record minimum in 2012 this this uh, minimum is way out of the cluster of points here I mean it was you know and we had 2011 um, here um, or 2016 here rather 2007 here Okay, uh, 2011, 2015, and, and so on. So a cluster of points. So here, you know, if this trend now continues, you know, we're, we're not going to be, you know, anywhere near the record and we'll be, you know, not even in second place. But, you know, who knows what happens. There could, you know, we still have, uh, you know, up to maybe possibly almost a month of melt to reach the, you know, if, if the melt ends this year on September 21st. So the question is, why is this, um, flattening. So, you know, I said I put together this tweet. I said, any thoughts on the slowdown? Perhaps negative feedbacks are kicking in, thinner and more broken. So, for example, the thinner and more broken up the ice gets, the more it spreads, cooling the air and surface water, um, right? Maybe reducing the melt rate. More clouds over open water and over the ice um, raises the albedo, causing um, cooling, blocking the sunlight, although the sun's getting pretty low in the sky this time of year up in the Arctic. 
Um, the ice is confined, you know, as the ice shrinks back, it becomes further and further away from the Arctic coastlines. It's confined to the center of the Arctic Ocean, and that results in much less export. So export out the Fram Strait, you know, and out the, the you know, in, in other places, uh, you know, really, really shuts off, basically. And it's only that, that loss mechanism greatly reduces. Okay, and then um, thinking a bit more, Another possibility is that the broken fractured thin ice may behave very different in rec calibration of the sensors. So 2019 ice is likely quite different from 2012 ice. The 2012, you know, is more solid, less fractured. So it may be messing up the sensors. You know, this is very puzzling that the ice is flattening out like this, given that the Arctic is so warm. So there's clearly things that we don't understand. And if those negative feedbacks are powerful enough you know who knows maybe the I've, I've thought for a while that that we'd have a blue ocean event by 2022 but if this type of thing continues then um you know we're looking much further out you know for a blue ocean event so you know the the story is evolving i mean it's it's uh, there's a lot of factors in the arctic which i guess that we don't understand because this is a real surprise um, this year, the, the last uh, few weeks to a month, you know, given how warm the Arctic is. So may have to revise my thinking on, you know, when we'll, when we'll actually see a blue ocean event. That's, you know, assuming that the sensors are still giving us a good indication of the reality there. But anyway, let's get back to, um, we'll get back to the earth greening. Okay, so Scientific American article recently, the earth stopped getting greener 20 years ago. Declining plant growth is linked to decreasing air moisture. So let's see what it had to say. So the synopsis is plant growth is declining all over the planet. Um, new research links the phenomena to decreasing moisture in the air. So I'll talk about the study, the peer reviewed paper. But basically, it points to satellite observations that revealed expanding vegetation worldwide during much of the 1980s and 90s. But then, about 20 years ago, 1998 or so, the trend stopped. Since then, more than half of the world's vegetated landscapes have been experienced a browning trend or decrease in plant growth, according to the authors. So this is a bad thing, of course. This is a reduction of the carbon sink. So there's something called the vapor pressure deficit. So at any given temperature, the ther theoretical amount of moisture that the air can actually hold, um, uh, the maximum amount of moisture that the earth can actually hold, or the saturation level, okay, if you take, if, if you subtract the amount of moisture that the air is actually holding, then that's the water vapor pressure deficit or just the vapor pressure deficit. So a high deficit is sometimes referred to as an atmospheric drought. Now, since the late 1990s, more than half of the world's vegetated landscapes have experienced a growing vapor pressure deficit or a drying pattern. And the climate models show that this vapor pressure deficit BPD is likely to continue increasing as the world warms. So this might have a substantially negative impact on vegetation. Okay, there was a 2010 study that showed greening increases in the 1990s had stalled or reversed. And it said that their declines were probably water related, but this paper has a lot more details and, and more information, new, new, new findings. Okay, not every corner of the earth is losing its vegetation, right? Parts of the Arctic are greening, you know, as their warming continues, but there's increasing prank, uh, and there's increasing plant growth still happening in other regions of the world, but on a global scale, average across the entire planet, the trend is pointing downward. And we'll have a look at the maps showing this. Um, okay, and the idea that, um, that uh, plants will grow faster with larger amounts of CO2. That's correct, but you know all of these other factors are also affecting plant growth. Rising CO2 does benefit plants up to a point, but it's only one factor. Plants are affected by many other symptoms of climate change, like rising temperatures, 
changing weather patterns, shifts in water availability, and so on. Um, so climate change on the whole is a net negative for the world's vegetation, including agriculture crops. Okay, um, now a report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPC, IPCC, emphasized the importance of land and vegetation as climate mitigation tools. You've heard of plans to, to plant basically, you know, a trillion trees. I mean, we definitely cannot afford to lose our carbon sinks. You know, we're losing our sinks of carbon in the ocean and we're losing them rapidly on land. Okay, now this is exclusively talking about the vegetation on land. Um, okay, so let's actually have a look. First of all, the IPCC paper um, is here. Okay, you can find the link in this article right here, the report for the IPCC paper. Um, so it came out um, a few weeks ago, just before, um, around the time I went on my vacation. Um, and this is the report here, and you can download um, different sections of the report. So um, it talks all about desertification, which reduces global primary productivity. It talks about land degradation, does the same thing, you know, loss of forests for, for agriculture, food security, uh, land climate interactions, and so on. So it may, it may um, I'll have a look at this report and maybe do some videos on it. This is the summary for policymakers. The, and uh, there's lots of uh, good information here. Um, you know, this is basically some of the key points about how important land is for human livelihoods. And, you know, people use one quarter to one third of land's net primary productivity for food, feed, fiber, timber, and energy, and so on. So probably well worth it to uh, do separate videos on this, but let's get to the um, let's get to the paper. So this is the Scientific American article here. Earth stopped getting greener 20 years ago, and now this is a peer-reviewed paper, which um, is linked right here on this link here. So you can go to this paper. It's open access. Um, okay, so it was published as open source, so it's accessible to anybody, no, no firewall. So basically, there, this atmospheric vapor pressure deficit is a critical variable for determining plant photosynthesis. And there were four global climate data sets that were looked at, and they all reveal a sharp increase in the vapor pressure deficit after the late 1990s. Okay, so the vegetation greening trend was also looked at by vegetation indexes um, from, uh, you know, and basically it shows that the um, greening of the earth stalled and then reversed um, around 1998. And the, the, the terrestrial gross primary productivity, GPP, was derived from two satellite-based models, um, showed persistent and widespread decreases. And it, this paper is attributing that to increased VPD, which offset the positive CO2 fertilization effect. Okay, so let's uh, get into this paper in more detail. So this is a key, very important factor. The vapor, okay, um, Oh, right here, basically. The first thing is that um, rising air temperature increases the saturated water vapor pressure at a rate of approximately 7% per degree of Kelvin, according to the clapeus clapeyron relationship. Okay, so when it's one degree warmer, the air can hold 7% more moisture at the saturation point. Now, where is this moisture coming from? 85% of it or so is coming from the ocean, okay? Um, a huge amount of vapor in the atmosphere is, is coming from the, the oceans, ocean, okay? I mean, there's also um, evaporation 
of water in the soils, there's evapotranspiration, there's other effects, but it's mostly the oceans. I'll continue in a second video. Thank you for listening.